Welcome to Safe Schools Rainbow Roundtable. It's Tuesday, June 18th, 2024, and happy Pride Month. This is a special four-part series at the Rainbow Roundtable on queer grief and how this affects LGBTQ youth and students. This very important topic is part of Safe Schools' commitment to stand up for queer youth and help navigate some of the most important issues they face in these challenging times. I'm Dr. Dan Sheridan, head psychologist of No Reservations. Joining us today for our discussion is the Director of Programming at the Children's Bereavement Center, Julissa Reynoso, podcaster and social media expert, Tiffany Williams, a member of the LGBTQ community, faith leader and pastor at United Church of Christ, Fort Lauderdale, Reverend Aaron Lauer, school educator, Kyle Summer, and chief operating officer of Safe Schools and pastor, Harold Marrero. We thank our partners that help make the Safe Schools Rainbow Roundtable possible, including the Quadrachi Family Foundation, AHF, and the Florida AIDS Walk, Children's Trust of Miami, and Hotspots Magazine Happening Out Television Network. With all of these talented individuals, let's consider queer grief and the tools and resources to face the challenges LGBTQ youth face. In this segment, we'll discuss practical tools and resources for dealing with grief in healthy ways. We've heard powerful stories of grief and resilience within the queer community, and now it's time to explore how we can support each other through these challenging times. Grief is a deeply personal experience, and for many queer individuals, it's compounded by societal challenges. One such challenge is disenfranchised grief. This occurs when a person's grief is not acknowledged or supported by their community. For example, same-sex partners may be excluded from the grieving process, referred to as a quote-unquote friend rather than a spouse, or even forced to sit at the back of their partner's funeral. This exclusion can make the grieving process even more difficult and have long-term impacts on mental health. Misgendering is another significant issue for trans and non-binary individuals. In death, as in life, they may face barriers to having their gender identity recognized. Misgendering or dead naming by healthcare workers or funeral practitioners can be particularly distressing for friends and family at a time when they're already vulnerable. Chosen families play a crucial role in supporting queer individuals through grief. Members of the queer community often rely on close networks of friends rather than biological relatives. These chosen families provide emotional support, help with funeral planning, and ensure that their loved ones are remembered and honored in meaningful ways. Let's also address the concept of complicated grief, also known as prolonged grief disorder. This occurs when someone becomes stuck in their grief, unable to cope with, life's many, with life many months after a loss. It's more likely to happen if the death was sudden, traumatic, or unexpected. Complicated grief can manifest in various ways, such as feeling stuck in sadness, not coping with daily life, or finding no enjoyment in activities. So, how can we support someone experiencing complicated grief? Here are a few strategies that have been found to be helpful. Keeping a steady routine. Maintaining regular habits such as eating and sleeping at consistent times can provide a sense of stability during a turbulent period. Self-compassion. Encourage those grieving to be kind to themselves. It's okay to feel happiness amidst grief, and small activities that bring joy can be very beneficial. Talking to friends, family, or community. Finding safe and trusted individuals to share feelings with can help normalize the grief experience and reduce feelings of isolation. Support groups, whether in person or online, can also be a valuable resource. Here in South Florida, the Children's Bereavement Center and its adult division, Lift From Loss, offers free peer support groups for individuals who have lost a loved one. These groups are open to anyone who has experienced a loss, whether recent or in the past, and those support groups are available in English, Spanish, and Creole, and provide a space for sharing experiences and finding comfort in community. The Children's Bereavement Center's mission is to empower children 
young adults, and their families to adjust to life after the loss of a loved one. Their vision is to restore hope for the future and establish their peer support model as the best practice for child and family bereavement services. Their healthful grieving model includes principles such as acknowledging that grief is a normal, natural process and that people have the ability to heal at their own pace. A caring environment and the camaraderie among grieving individuals play vital roles in the healing process. The group experience helps participants regain a sense of control and empowerment, increase awareness of available resources, and maintain self-esteem and trust in others. As we consider these resources and strategies, I'd like to ask our panelists, what are some specific tools or practices you have found helpful in supporting those dealing with grief? And how can we create more inclusive and supportive environments for queer individuals navigating bereavement? I think it's important to uh, really make those connections with other organizations that have really great resources for the queer community, especially when, when they're after a loss, everything can feel so destabilizing, right? Um, and people may not have um, funeral services that might be queer friendly, uh, spiritual services, therapists. So making sure to be intentional in collecting that information to provide to the community when it's in need. Um, I, I can't speak highly about that because you don't want to refer somebody to a person or a place where they're not going to be welcomed and they don't understand the different dynamics affecting the queer community. I'd just like to echo that sentiment, <laughs> understanding that not all, not all organizations can support queer folk in the right ways, despite having the best intentions, right? Um, I think about, in particular, our queer and our non-binary and trans youth. Um, something that I have sort of discussed, argued, <laughs> fought over um, with the administration and the school system that I work for is the idea of an ID. Hmm. So student IDs, um, according to legal counsel for the district that I work for, constitute a legal document. Mm. Well, fine. <laughs> but for our non-binary and trans youth who now use affirming and chosen names, what does that need to look like for them when the purpose of a student ID is not so that I can identify you across the room. Mm -hmm. It's should something happen, I can identify your body. So what does that look like for a trans kid who has now been in a tragedy? <laughs> How do we as school administrators make that call to a parent? Mm -hmm. Who am I identifying? How am I reopening wounds in a moment that is one of the most painful? Yeah. Yeah. I think you're I, I think that's so great to talk about. I think the people's level of comfort regarding situations like that we really need more training around mm -hmm. that. We really need more education. And we also need to confront our own, uh, our own issue, uh, issues with grief mm. and trauma. Absolutely. So uh, at CBC really, uh, Dan did a great um, introduction about what the Children's Bereavement Center does in helping not just children and adults and process grief and loss, but we also do trainings in the community to help everybody, not just mental health professionals, really feel comfortable with what does that look like? What does grief, what is grief, right? And how can you help support individuals in the school system, kids in the school system that um, are grieving, that are processing trauma? Mm -hmm. I mean, even with our parents, I think about PFLAG, right? If we are honest, for many parents of queer youth, the anger that they feel that leads to them disowning their children is they've lost the kid that they thought mm -hmm. they had. Yes. Mm -hmm. They are losing the future that they thought that that baby was going to have. And unless we meet them where they are and let them know that is okay. It is okay for you to be afraid for your child. It is okay that they are now finding themselves, guess what? You get to have a different kid. Mm -hmm. But and they have to grieve. Two, right, they have to grieve. They have to say, it's oh, I'm okay with losing who I thought my kid was. Mm -hmm. And now I have such this beautiful opportunity 
to get to know this new person. But it's if we don't address grief, that never gets to happen. They just sit yeah. in that anger. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that you brought that in because grief is not just something that happens when you lose someone, when someone dies. Grief has many layers and many aspects. You know, you, like you said, a parent, when a child comes out, the parent does have to grieve the fact that it, all the expectations that they had on that child are now dead. The, 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 there's a dead child in the room. And that that's complicated. And I think that our own societal misunderstandings of grief and inability to grieve adds co compounds to that issue and it adds you know layers to how how can i now deal with this um and even beyond that even the our own like you know in the um, we talked we talked about how growing up at least for me i was never allowed to be me i was always this lie of someone else i was always this person that wasn't me and recently I was, you know, I was walking my dog, like um, uh, we have a golden retriever, I was watching, walking him, he pulls me. And I was just thinking, and I saw a kid uh, going to prom, he was like well-dressed, going to prom, and I'm like, oh yeah, I remember doing that. But then I started thinking to myself, but was I ever happy? And this realization set in that it's like, no, I was never happy in high school. There was always this deep sense of sadness that I was always lying to everyone around me and lying to myself because I couldn't be myself. So how much of that, I mean, obviously that, that has, you know, that comes up with you and, and it hits you in your 20s and your 30s and as you grow, and as you, you're processing this as you grow up. But for me, it's almost like I wish there was something that I could have done to be like, I'm going to grieve this person that never was. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sit there and not feel sorry for myself, but totally meet that part of me in you know in in this space and say i'm so sorry that that happened to you yes absolutely i also on the on the flip end of that you definitely i think we all have to sit with that with the grief of what we wish it would would have been but i have seen how the queer community really has um try to heal from that. Uh, I recently attended one a, a queer prom and it was so beautiful. It was amazing and so healing for people to really um, be themselves finally mm -hmm. in something that maybe they initially they weren't able to. And that's just one aspect of it. I'm, there's so many other ways that people are trying to, yes, process that grief and sit with it, but also heal and move forward with it. Because we do not, um, it's not something that you get over. Grief is not something you get over. It's something you move forward with, right? And sometimes it can feel very intense, sometimes not, not so heavy. And the way that we choose to move forward in that healing process can be very beautiful. Yeah, um, I have actually a little like story. Um, so this was like, like maybe you want to say like a month or so. I went to go visit a friend in North Carolina and she was like, let's go to the local drag show. I was like, awesome, let's go. And we're going and, you know, we've all gone to drag brunch, I'm assuming. We all know it's usually sometimes a pageant show because you got the most glamorous outfits, you know, boas, feathers, all that. But there was this one queen that she was different. And the best way to describe her drag is like, an acid trip, like literally an acid trip. <laughs> she was, I mean, her makeup looked more like war paint and she had like this moo moo and she had like this big clown curly like hair. Like she was just like out there. And, but she had all these pearls. I mean, adorned. Like I'm talking about like, it was like covering half of her body. And she had bracelets and earrings and rings. And everyone in the at the brunch, I could tell they were kind of just like, oh, okay. And even the songs that she had selected were more like 70s raw queen, but not the usual stuff that you would see in a show. And I was like, I feel like there's something more to her story. And sure enough, at the end of the show, they, the MC was like, oh, this is my good friend Pearl. And she explains why her drag is the way it is. And she says that the necklaces that she's wearing are not even all her pearls. She has giant bowls at home just filled to the brim with pearls. 
And she says, these are all my friends I lost during the HIV and AIDS pandemic. Each single strand of pearls she gave to her friends at the hospital and those were given back to her. And she has been, she had said, she's been clear for many years that she's HIV free, but she holds on to these pearls as her, has her grieving process. And she says, I wear these for my friends who didn't make it. And I take them everywhere I go with me. And I tell you, like, there was not a dry eye in the house. Everyone was sobbing. And I was just like, I had one of my friends had brought her friends and she was, she had told us, she's like, oh, I didn't really like her drag before she had told her story. And then afterwards, she was like, I kind of feel bad. I didn't know. And I'm like, well, you can't really judge a book by its cover. And this is how she grieves her friends. She takes them physically with her in her mm-hmm. performance. And I just thought that was so, so beautiful. You know, it really speaks to the power of uh, art and creative practices in grieving. Um, And that we could all grieve in different ways and just share these different types of techniques to help each other. But we have to move on to our next section. Um, I want to thank you for your insights. And it's clear that while grief is a personal journey, having the right support and resources can make a significant difference. As we transition to our final segment, the future outlook, we'll explore a hopeful future for the queer community when it comes to grief and support. We'll discuss how we can can continue to build a more inclusive, understanding, and supportive environment for everyone.